Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guest is James Polis. James creates and advises brands and enterprises at the intersection of technology, media, and design. He is the co-founder and executive editor of the American Mind at the Claremont Institute and the co-founder and publisher of Return at New Founding. He's the author of the book, Art of Being Free, and his work has appeared in the Claremont Review of Books, Le Figaro, National Affairs, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, and more. And he holds a PhD in government from Georgetown University, though we will not hold that against him. And he says, at least his uh, blurbs say, he lives on the edge of L.A. Why somebody would brag about that, I'm not sure. My wife and I joke occasionally that uh, we really should endow a statue of Virgil to put there in that little park right where the exit of LAX is. And uh, But anyway, uh, welcome, James. Abandon all hope, ye who exit here. Exactly. Let Virgil be your guide. Obviously, a man who's read his classics somewhere along the line. That airport's given us all a bad name. <laughs> Anyway, today we're going to be talking about James's new book. It's called Human Forever, The Digital Politics of Spiritual War, and kind of the history of how it came into my hands, and for me then to reach out to James is a little unusual. Usually I hear about it, you know, order, uh, kindle it on Amazon, take a look at it. If I like it, I reach out to the author. In this case, my longtime friend and collaborator, Jordan Hall, I believe signed up to get the first one of the first hundred copies as an NFT. And he got all excited about it. So I mean, emails, oh, you got to read this, got to read this. And I said, well, you know, uh, Jordan's recommendations are usually good. But I said, let me look at it. So he sent, a, sent me a copy and I looked at it and I go, hmm, this is kind of a strange ass book, but it sure looks interesting. And based on that, I reached out to James and said, hey, James, you willing to chat if I read this sucker? And, uh, and he said, yes. And so that's how we got to where we are. The next step, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is where you can get it. You, the readers, if you find this conversation motivating, you want to reach out and get your copy. It's not available on Amazon. I checked this morning. So, uh, James, if people who listen to this episode decide they want to know more, how do they get a copy of the book? Well, it's on a site called Canonic. That's canonic.xyz. I'll spell out the whole word for you. C-A-N-O-N-I-C dot X-Y-Z. I can spell. This is a platform where you, yes, you can uh, publish your own work onto the Bitcoin blockchain and sell it for Bitcoin. So it's uh, not just a publicity stunt. You know, I wanted to show and not just tell with this book that technology has advanced to a point where Americans can create valuable culture on their own initiative and share it and market it and create um, even, you know, algorithmic markets around the artifacts that they have to introduce into the world. If you have something to say, you don't need to be a blue check. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to know how to code. You don't, don't need to live in Silicon Valley or anywhere in particular. You just need to be able to learn a little bit, get your hands dirty in technology, which Americans uh, used to love doing and, and some still do. And all of the gatekeepers are gone. And, uh, you know, I mean, I... <laughs> I've been uh, around the publishing circuit a couple times and did the the big New York publishing route back with the first book. And in some ways, it's very exciting. You see yourself in every Barnes and Noble, and it's this appearance of ubiquity. But the reality is, a lot of the publishing houses don't really market or promote your book. What they do is <laughs> is they tell you that you need to email everyone in your Rolodex and sort of grovel before them and beg for that you know that star on Amazon and the, tell them how important those first week sales are really rather demoralizing, in my opinion. And, you know, we just live in a time now where the gatekeepers are are especially harsh in what they deem worthy of publication. Uh, so I wanted to sort of sit back and do a book that was, you know, under 300 pages, pretty tight, but covered a lot of ground and was something that I could turn around fast, uh, not have to wait for, for New York to sort of slurp it up slowly and chew it and, and then ooze it back out into the world. 
And Canonical is very good at that. Uh, it's true. We did a, a first run limited edition 100 NFT books. These aren't just cartoon monkeys that you can trade with your friends, although, you know, I'm definitely not here to tell people not to get their friends rich. Uh, definitely favor that. But there's a lot more that you can use with this technology. And one of those things is put out a book. So we did a, a 100 leather bound foil stamped hardcover uh, handmade uh, volumes for the NFTs, 600 bucks a pop sold out in about 25 hours. Some people, you know, their eyes popped a little bit. $600. Well, what do you think this is important? Why? Yes. Yes, I do. And I think, you know, another thing that Americans need to remember and, and can take advantage of right now is that, you know, the the value of the dollars flying around, nobody really knows who's who's at the wheel economically, sociopolitically. And this is an opportunity for you to step into the marketplace and hang a price tag on yourself, make a wager, bet on what you're worth. And if you do that with confidence and you really do have something to say, people take notice. They rally around that. So it's been gratifying to see uh, the response to the book in, in that regard with, with you and, you know, some, some others who will remain nameless. Very cool. Very cool. And as always, of course, for our listeners, the link to the Bitcoin store will be on the episode page at jimrutcho.com. So check it out there. Next thing before we really jump in, somewhere I read that you wrote the book in three weeks. Is that true? It is, it is mostly true. I had three weeks to do the book. The footnotes really became endnotes because I, I wanted nice clean pages. The endnotes took a little bit longer than that. They took about an additional week. But, you know, this is, uh, this is the kind of thing where um, after the 2016 election, my, my first book on Alexis de Tocqueville came out right on inauguration weekend. So it was up there, you know, sandwiched between all the Hillary books and all the Trump books. And the basic theme of the book was, you know, look, American life is is constitutively crazy in a certain sense. We are an unsettled people. This goes back all the way, you know, if you want to trace it all the way back to Augustine, you can see a sort of analysis of of the human spirit or the human soul as this, uh, you know, this this oscillating thing that's forever swinging back and forth between uh, uh, a sort of brooding inwardness and a frantic outwardness. And that's a tempo that has characterized American life really from the beginning. Alexis de Tocqueville saw it. He talked about it. And that's why it was important for him that Americans remain in circulation publicly, that they continuously encounter one another, warts and all, face to face, mediated by institutions, mediated by uh, religion, but nevertheless required to sort of build and rebuild the world, the lived world each day, which is an unceasing labor, uh, an unceasing labor that isn't necessarily going to be fun. Uh, it can be, can be productive. Sometimes it's just hard work. It feels more like a trial. But in order for us to uh, to face the day every day, we need to get good at the art of being free. And that that entails a certain kind of friendship. And so my my call to America, you know, such as it was, was to take these lessons to heart, to realize that we we had what we needed right now to to attend to them uh, fruitfully. And then, of course, you know, we all got to watch America sort of go crazy over the next uh, several years. And so I found myself sitting here as, you know, as, a, as, as you mentioned, a, a doctor of political theory and, and thinking, you know, gosh, if I cannot really account for why my message is being rejected wholesale by so many people, then probably my academic discipline deserves to die as much as all these other academic disciplines struggling to account for the reality in which we live. And that led me fairly directly and fairly quickly toward the recognition that, you know, well, digital technology has mastered the world, mastered the world in a way that no single human being or, or even group of human beings can do. And so I've got to go beginner's mind on, on media theory, on communications theory, uh, understanding what digital is. And that was a years long process. And uh, in the early, you know, early, early couple of years, I had to learn on the job. I was, you know, uh, writing essays and, and so forth actively. And there's really no time to disappear into your castle and pontificate about things. You got to kind of write as you go. So for that first few years there, you know, I got a lot of people saying like, well, this sounds really interesting, but I don't understand what you're talking about. And nowadays what I hear is, wow, this sounds really interesting, but I don't understand Bitcoin. So progress. Yeah, yeah, moving in the right direction, right? We'll talk about Bitcoin at the very end, but mostly we'll talk about the book. Before we, last thing before we actually jump in is sometimes I do some definitions up front. I uh, will do some definition-like questions along the way, but there's one word which you use 22 times, which people use in somewhat differing ways, and it's actually a quite important word, and that's Gnostic. How do you want us to take Gnostic when you use it? 
Gnostic, one of the, the longest lasting heresies in the biblical tradition. It, it seems to want to crop up everywhere. The, the Jews have their own sort of strains of Gnosticism. Eastern Orthodox have, uh, are no strangers to, uh, to Gnostic heresy. The Bogomils and others, of course, it appeared in, in Catholic form with the Cathars and others. Protestantism, of course, in some ways, uh, you know, fertile grounds for all kinds of Gnosticism being the place where new denominations of Christianity seem most ready to appear. But in terms of what it actually is, uh, comes from the ancient Greek for knowledge, gnosis, as in secret knowledge. The idea being that, you know, we may not be able to interact with God, but we can understand the secrets of the created world. And that the secret knowledge therein is really that, you know, it's bad news that we're human beings. We're kind of in this prison that's been formed for us. The limits of our, of our physical bodies are things which we must learn how to, how to shatter and, and exceed. And the goal is to uh, basically let loose, break free the, the spirit from the, the confines of the created or physical world. With the idea that, you know, our, our destiny, once, once our spirit is freed in this way, is to become God or to become as gods. To leave our, our humanity behind, uh, shuffle off the coil of our mere humanity, and enter into a kind of paradisiac state where we have elevated or ascended into a new plane of existence. So that's that's the, the nutshell of it for me. That's how I used it in the book. All right. Uh, you know, it's a kind of the tradition of Plato and even Buddhism, right? They're all wanting us to transcend the here and now and move on to something else, right? But of course, uh, specifically in the West, typically Gnosticism is often talked about in the forms of Christian heresy that started in the Middle East and then kept on spreading, as you as you point out. It keeps popping up. In fact, it's hiding in the hills today, probably somewhere in uh, former Yugoslavia. So let's now get to the book itself. You start out, first sentence in the book, is, or two sentences, is we are running out of time to preserve the space of our progeny needs to live life's worth living. Confronting this reality, a consequence of our sanctification of technological advancement beyond the reach of human responsibility is the purpose of this book. Could you say just a little bit more about that and then we'll move on. Well, let's start with the word, word uh, responsibility. Um, if, you, if you go back to the etymology of the word, something I, I always find uh, at least somewhat enlightening and sometimes very much so, what you discover is the, the ancient root of that word is the word for repeatedly pouring out libations and sacrifice, really a religious act, a liturgical act of a sort. And so when we think about responsibility in those terms, in, in terms of to whom are you responsible in your worship or in your sacrifice, the idea animating this book was a lot of people today, you know, at, at all levels of society, increasingly feel that as a result of this total domination of the world by our, our digital devices and other entities, there's, there's really no hope left for us other than to pivot, to shift our, our worship to those entities themselves, uh, that really technology has exceeded our human capability, has sort of taken away our pride, and that we, instead of trying to figure out, you know, we're human beings, we had better get good at it, instead to figure out how to build machines that so outstrip us in our capabilities that we can just hand them our responsibilities, hand them control, you know, give them the wheel of the ship, make them the Kubernetes, to go back to the, the Greek for the steersman. You know, this is where Norbert Wiener got the word cybernetics from. Really, this, this longing to just kind of give up the burdens of being human, uh, transfer those responsibilities over to the machines, visible and invisible, and, and hope and trust and, and pray in a way that, that that's what's going to save us, that that's what's going to deliver us from our predicaments and our challenges, that we won't have to, you know, worry about all the all the horrible things about being human anymore. All right. Now then, you raise the ante further. Neither mortal nor divine digital technology now claims the once solely human prerogative to give order to the universe. Human organization is no longer supreme. The modern politically scientific state pales in efficiency and reliability before the always-on algorithms that invisibly permeate the body politic. Pretty strong words. Now, is that hyperbole or is that actually what you think? 
Well, I mean, it's not just what I think, you know, you go go around and ask everyone who's running a major international organization, ask Eric Schmidt, you know, ask the NSA, ask Five Eyes, uh, ask uh, Vladimir Putin. I mean, you track the discourse at that level and it's clear there is a global war going on right now as major powers, major interests uh, scramble to assert what kind of sovereignty or control they can over the, the swarm of digital entities in their slice of space time. Chinese are doing it. Uh, they're moving very fast, programming the bots to be Taoist, basically, and uh, and using those those bots as a social credit system to keep everyone uh, in line. The Russians are, you know, are, are also turning inward in that respect. And the role of uh, of using uh, religion as a kind of foundation for establishing digital sovereignty seems to me to be plainly, you know, unfolding there. But it's not just, you know, it's not just the, the quote unquote autocracies. I mean, I think India is moving in a similar direction with the, with the way that it's establishing a more nationalist kind of approach to Internet regulation. Israel is, is a civilization state in its own right and is definitely pursuing technology on, on that basis. The EU is distinguishing itself from, uh, from, from the U.S. and I guess the U.K. in some ways and taking a much harsher and, and more you know, continental approach view of, uh, of internet regulation. The Vatican wants to be a big player in this space. They've already made, made some moves and orbitures and held some conferences. And, you know, based on my kind of semi-inside knowledge of what goes on in, in, the, in the church uh, bureaucracy, there's a strong interest in establishing a proper Catholic theology of, uh, of media. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was a Catholic convert. Uh, his son, Eric McLuhan, has written on these themes. Uh, and then in the U.S. and U.K., you know, in, in Five Eyes world, there's a there's an active conflict right now over, you know, over which faction uh, in the Anglosphere is going to decide how the digital swarm is is governed and on what basis. There's open talk of social credit here in the in the Anglosphere and in the U.S. Severe disagreements over whose hands should be on the wheel. It's a little tricky in the U.S. You know, this is a place where the, the, the easy option is closed to us. We can't just establish an official religion and program all of our bots with that religion and use that to keep people in line. You know, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's not surprising to see some folks attempt to do that. I think that some are surprised that this has more come out of the left than out of the right over the past, uh, you know, 10 years. Whatever you want to say about the Wokies, they do seem to, to understand that the shortcut to reestablishing sovereignty in, uh, in a digital age is to catechize the bots uh, into your comprehensive doctrine, into your religion, into your spiritual understanding of the, the essence of, of man, and to use the swarm to impose that understanding on people, to educate them or re-educate them. Uh, into that worldview. I don't think that graft is going to take in America. I don't think that American civilization, the American people can really choke that down. Uh, I think that's you know why we're seeing what's unfolding with tw Twitter right now, unfolding in the way that it is. But what it means is Americans have this sort of special burden. They got to sort of bear this special kind of cross, which is we can't just you know all disappear into the monasteries. We can't become a theocracy. But we also can't, you know, just just pretend that it's 1983 forever, continue to act as if uh, we haven't unleashed these incredibly powerful machines on the world. We have to return to ingenuity. We have to return to tinkering. And we've got to return to an understanding that not everyone in this country is going to share their their the same set of absolute beliefs about the ultimate questions. And that's going to have an impact on, on how we govern. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be messier. It's going to take more work, but you know, I, I do think that you know, relative to how other folks are doing in the world, it, it might still be the case that Americans have some special advantages, a special kind of willingness to uh, to swim in choppy waves and, and to set out on an uncharted course. So, you know, in, in conclusion, I don't think there's really that much controversy about the fact that uh, that we've unleashed these machines in a way where uh, everyone who can is is trying to get a grip on the steering wheel. The main question for us Americans is how we're going to deepen our souls so that we understand that it's worth remaining human without sort of turning against ourselves, without falling so deeply into a penitent mood that we allow the, the created world of culture around us to fall apart. Yeah. Though it's funny, I'm one of those people who put this damn thing into motion. I started building uh, consumer online systems in 1981. So really, really early on and did the same in uh, for uh, business world, internet infrastructure, et cetera, been involved with either as a founder 
director or investor in 17 startups. Uh, you know, I've been through the drill. I'm a believer, not a Luddite. Nonetheless, I do like to remind people that at least for now, it's not clear how long that will be, kinetics still trumps virtual, right? I think Putin has been a little surprised at that, that the real world still exists and can transcend the power of the virtual. I point out to people that if he really wanted to, the governor of California on his own initiative could shut down Facebook and arrest their management team, right? Could do it. Unlikely to actually do it, but he could. Men with guns still at the end of the day are the basis of, uh, are the final arbiters. And it's useful to keep that in mind, even though you're absolutely right, of course, that the virtual is growing more powerful by the day. And in, in terms of mimetic warfare, what some of us call five gen warfare, it is now probably the most important battlefield. But it's useful to remind ourselves, look at Ukraine and Russia, artillery, you know, rifles, hand-to-hand combat even, still a real thing. So we should all keep just a little bit of perspective there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think this is this is very interesting because we've moved rather quickly from a world in which it seemed like, you know, Russia was being presented as the source of all of the, the crazy propaganda flowing across the Internet. And now, you know, who which which regime is not in on that game? It seems like every regime that has, you know, the uh, the ability to grab a, a, a megaphone is just trying to pump into the into the airspace, into the headspace. Their their official doctrines, you know, I mean, all of say what you will about the, the the COVID virus over these past two plus years, we have seen the official story just turn on a dime repeatedly. And there's something, you know, in that that speaks to more than just the particularities of, of the virus or the vaccines, but speaks to the fact that, yes, you know, there is just as, as Marshall McLuhan suggested, a, a global information war playing out where the distinction between combatant and civilian is is wiped away, and you know, I, I I understand why it is that uh, that the U.S. has decided on waging war more at a virtual level than than a physical level. I understand why it is that the NSA and Five Eyes has gained so much power, relatively speaking, at the expense of uh, of the Department of Defense. Even something like the the nuclear bomb, you know, the nuclear missiles. This was supposed to be the the weapon that would allow the U.S. to uh, dominate the world forever it turned out you couldn't really use it that much, if at all. So there was a lot of pressure to create weaponry that was that was super powerful in in the way that not even nukes were. And I think if you look at kind of the military intelligence origins of uh, the internet infrastructure, it's easy to understand how you know how how a bunch of guys would say, "Hey, this is great. We got a weapon. We can use it." Anytime, anywhere in the world, we can even just leave the damn thing on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't have to blow anyone up. We don't have to leave any bodies on the battlefield. We can just wage this war sort of in people's consciousnesses, uh, in the psyche, using controls of information flows, understanding how, uh, you know, to poke the swarm and make the swarm do the things that we want to do. That's all understandable. But, you know, these these tools are, are powerful and these weapons are oftentimes indifferent to the, the agendas or the, the dreams of their creators. And now we find ourselves in a position where, you know, these weapons are being used against citizens or subjects in their own countries. Uh, they're being used by some groups of citizens against others. It's really a mess. And it's, uh, it's reminiscent of the dangerous and violent effect that the printing press had on, on European politics. Americans did pretty well under print. We did really well under electricity. Digital came along. I think a lot of folks thought, you know, gosh, well, we created these things and we dreamed the best dreams and we're sort of the you know, we got the best ethics. And so whatever we make is going to be good. And so this is going to be great. This is going to basically turn the world into America or turn America into the world. And of course, that's not exactly what happened. Much more complicated, but in some ways, painfully simple that these tools that we created did not particularly care to do what it is that we wanted. And we now need to look at what's already happened and recognize that this is a totally different medium. Uh, TV was all about the human imagination. If you can dream it, you can do it. Uh, Willy Wonka is singing about pure imagination. John Lennon is singing about imagine. This is a different thing. Here, uh, machine memory is more powerful than human imagination. And that's a big shock to Americans. It makes a lot of them feel demoralized and confused. You know, I, I, I think that that's, that's understandable too, but we do need to recognize, got to remember who we are, remember what we're capable of. We can return authority to uh, to flesh and blood human beings. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. We got to share space with, with these infinite, invisible entities flying around, being being incredibly interoperable and, and communicating instantaneously. 
but this is a situation we put ourselves into. And so uh, it's time to start thinking about how to, how to deal. Yeah, indeed. Let me cut a couple uh, points there. We should always keep in mind, we can say no, right? I did an experiment back in 2019, and I documented it in a medium essay titled Reclaiming Our Cognitive Sovereignty, Why I Went Back to a Flip Phone and How You Can Too. You know, again, as somebody who helped start one of the cell phone companies but dealing with these technologies from the beginning, uh, it was really a kind of a weird thing to do was to analyze all the, th- the services I got from my smartphone and deciding how I would do it without a smartphone and then taking those actions and then getting rid of the smartphone and going to a flip phone. And it was really amazing and empowering. And I documented it in a uh, rather long essay and a bunch of other people did too. And I'm now seeing more and more people, especially young people, who are signing off from Facebook and Instagram and probably the worst of the bunch, TikTok. Of course, it's not yet a mass trend, but it's always important for people to keep in mind, we don't have to play this game if we don't want to. You won't starve if you don't look at TikTok. Nothing bad will happen if you delete your Facebook account. I know hundreds of people that don't have Facebook accounts. So yes, this beast is trying to suck us in, but we still have sovereignty and autonomy if if we want to use it. I think that's always worth keeping in mind. Next, this is a little further down in my notes, but let's do it here. I mean, it was it's very clear when I was reading your book that you were strongly influenced by the McLuhanist perspective. And it might not hurt just to lay out a little bit of, you know, sort of uh, mainline McLuhan theory, you know, the acoustic, the uh, literary, print, electronic, et cetera, and now digital. Just take a quick run through that and give a little bit of how McLuhan sees those things kind of becoming embedded in one another and, and evolving through time. Sure. So, you know, McLuhan comes along as, as a media theorist. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think of media, they think of like TV and, and radio, maybe newspapers. And that's not, uh, that's not, not inaccurate, but there's kind of a deeper panorama here. So I'll just try to lay that out. Media, basically communications technology for, for McLuhan. Uh, he referred to them as extensions of man. So these are sort of tools that we use to extend our our capabilities, our functionalities beyond what we can do with our given incarnate and and ensouled beings. Uh, You know, McLuhan, Catholic guy, but, you know, for him, Aristotle was an important figure. Aristotle's fundamental distinction between things that are alive and things that are not alive. And Aristotle, the biologist saying like, you know, if you really want to understand the nature of living things, you can't just reduce them analogically or mathematically to buckets of things that are not alive. There's a fundamental distinction there. Uh, There is anima that is within the living things. And so McLuhan's desire to introduce back into social science and social theory a proper respect for and understanding of aliveness is, I think, a big part of his media theory. So, uh, so if you're looking th- uh, at the development of, uh, of human life in terms of uh, the impact of communications tools on the people who create them over time, you go back to, well, you got, you got spoken language, you have the, the oral medium. And that went on for some time before the alphabet came along. Uh, you mentioned Plato. Uh, Plato lamented in one of his dialogues uh, through through Socrates that reading was like trying to talk to a statue, basically, you know, this this motionless figure with this sign around their neck, and you could kind of read it and you ask it questions, but it wouldn't answer. That's probably one reason why Plato opted for the dialogue form uh, in, his, in his dialogues. But the transformation from oral to uh, to alphabetic culture was massive. Uh, it took you from from Homer to Plato. And for someone like Nietzsche, that was the kind of the ultimate rivalry or duality. And uh, alphabetic culture, uh, you know, of course, continued on to this very day. But other things started to happen too. So you got the uh, you got the, the the written word. And you got the, the scribal era as uh, McLuhanites will oftentimes refer to it, where, you know, it's the Middle Ages. You have not an infinite number of monks in front of an infinite number of scriptoria, but a large number, nevertheless, hold up, systematically recording, uh, recalling and recording uh, the, uh, the, no- the inherited knowledge and wisdom of the world. That was the last time when, uh, when memory was as important to the structure of communications and culture as it is today. 
which is one reason why uh, McLuhanites such as uh, Mark Stallman, from whom I learned a lot, he runs the Center for the Study of Digital Life. Mark is fond of saying digital retrieves the medieval, uh, something that that sometimes spooks people. I know Americans are like, wait a minute, we didn't even exist back then. So what does that mean for America? Uh, And we can talk about that a little bit down the road if you want. And the scribal era is suddenly replaced by uh, what McLuhan called the Gutenberg galaxy, the the world of print. Uh, Suddenly you go from, from monks safeguarding knowledge in their in their monasteries to, you know, anyone who can get their hands on one of these machines can print up, you know, as many copies of the Bible as they want. They can do it in their own translation, put it in the hands of anyone walking around in the street. And then suddenly anyone with one of these things in their hands can start having their own interpretations of Holy Scripture. Oh, my goodness. And we, you know, we saw how that turned out. Uh, Some good news and some bad news. Martin Luther, I'm just trying to reform the church. And then suddenly he, there's there's another church. And then suddenly congregations in Germany are, are starting to throw all uh, morality to the winds and uh, and basically uh, just launching directly into, you know, raping, pillaging. And Luther has to, you know, scramble to write letters to these guys saying, hey, you know, that's not what I meant. Well, you know, the, the technology begs to differ. And that's uh, kind of one of the themes of, of McLuhan is that these tools that we create these different mediums, they have effects on us, uh, which we do not intend, which we do not choose, and which oftentimes we do not understand. And for McLuhan, that goes back to Aristotle once again, uh, where Aristotle's uh, theory of causation plays a big role. Uh, For McLuhan, the way to understand media theory and the impact of media on us, the way in which we shape our tools and they shape us in turn, is through Aristotle's formal cause. Uh, this is not like, you know, a billiard ball hits, hits another one and that that's the form of causation. It's not like, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, people are born capable of, you know, sexually maturing and then they do and they have more kids and on and on we go. It's not that kind of causation. This is a kind of causation that's, that's much more environmental. Aristotle suggests the soul is the form of the body. And so these are things that are not quite as easy to understand as the way they're oftentimes portrayed. Even today, you can, you know, sort of look up formal cause on the internet and you get all these crazily wrong presentations of formal cause. Oh, it's like a, you know, an architect makes a blueprint and the blueprint's the formal cause of the pyramid. It's like, no, 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 no. This is almost exactly the opposite of that. This is something that is not anyone's idea. It isn't a plan. It isn't something that anyone has formulated. This is the the environment, the form of these technologies having a, a an independent, if reciprocal, effect on our senses, our sensibilities, which um, of our faculties are are enhanced or sharpened, uh, which which of them are are backgrounded or or weakened or dulled. You know, there's a little bit of Gestalt theory in, in here for people who care about that f- sort of figure and ground. Different different technological environments pull certain things about us forward, make them more important, stress them, put emphasis on them, make them stronger, and other things weaker. And so uh, McLuhan and his and his son, after McLuhan's you know guru period, which was ultimately very dissatisfying to him, the McLuhan sat down and and tried to figure out a taxonomy of media effects, four effects that they came up with that were sort of complementary to uh, to Aristotle's four causes. And you know, in good Catholic faction, these were these were analogical. They were not things that were intended to happen in sequence. They were all going on all at the same time. Uh, and the task of the media theorist was to was to sharpen their awareness of it and sort of look for clues. For McLuhan, it was a big deal that the, the figure of the detective became so prominent in, uh, in Western culture. He and his son were, were fond of saying that effects precede causes. They show up as these sort of clues, which, uh, which we can figure out uh, how to read. It was big for McLuhan that artists were our sort of early warning systems who were good at picking up on these clues in a in an intuitive or heuristic kind of way. You know, one of the reasons why I think art is suffering today is because so many artists have been uh, have been whipsawed by these technological developments and don't really know how to perform that function anymore. And to the extent that we can get that going again, that'll be good for everyone. And so uh, let's see. After uh, after printing press, you you know you have uh, waves of war and everything and. and and the Western way of war is religious, so uh, so expect more of this stuff as, as time goes on, I think. Then you get radio. Radio, electricity, you get lights on at night in Paris, and everyone thinks it's a wonderland. And you know, shortly thereafter, Europe just starts uh, trying to destroy itself, root and branch. Uh, so electricity, not so good for Europe. You know, radio, uh, literally the form of 
dictatorship, you know, just people standing, standing in front of the, the radio device and speaking into it. And suddenly you can communicate instantaneously with, you know, whoever's on the other end on the set. And around this time, you know, you start getting cadres of scientists in Europe and the U.S. and basically wealthy donors who want to try to figure out what's going on with these new media. You know, gosh, uh, radio, that seemed like it didn't really work out the way that we had hoped. Turned into World War One. turned into uh, World War Two. And they start, you know, doing doing research into these media with, uh, with mixed results. And then TV comes along and people think like, oh, well, you know, TV, even McLuhan, like, ah, oh, this is kind of like hypnosis. Everyone will just sit down in front of the boob tube kind of tune out, go on the inner trip, what could go wrong? And well, you know, the technology had other ideas. The age of TV, I think Bob Dylan was right. You know, this was a, was an atomic age of, of explosive imagination in music uh, and in television because of electricity, the, the use of color. You know, the, I, I joke that uh, that all Americans became people of color when the, the wonderful world of Disney first uh, first switched from black and white to color. You had Tinkerbell fly out in front of your dreary drab tv set and wave for magic wand and suddenly you were uh going on a technicolor trip in the, the comfort of your own home so yes there was some inwardness going on there but the way that it, it manifested uh around the world was really a deep conviction that whoever dreamed the best and purest dreams uh really deserved to rule the world uh and in many cases they did you look at hollywood you look at the way that, that film and television in the u.s became really the main the main export both to shape and reshape people's minds and attitudes abroad but also as a representative of America of what what America represented and what it could be and it was out of that culture a culture that really took this this worshipful venerating attitude toward uh, the imagination from which we got digital technology you know you got guys who who really enjoyed taking acid and thinking about saving the world uh they they build some machines and they think you know well probably these machines are going to help do what we built them to do and once again the technology had other ideas so for uh for McLuhan you know the advent of the computer what did it do it retrieved what he called I'm paraphrasing here uh, uh perfect memory total and complete which is something that uh, had definitely been absent from the sort of psycho cultural landscape uh, all throughout the electric age. And what, you know, what gets obsolesced, that's another one of McLuhan's media effects. There's uh, there's enhanced, there's a sort of flip where things, something gets so intense that it just kind of flips into what, it, what its opposite is. And then there's, there's retrieve and then there's obsolesce. And so, you know, we're, we're sitting here having to think about, you know, what does digital technology obsolesce in our, in our cultural in our shared shared space time and what it obsolesces is exactly what it is that we'd come to think was the most powerful and, and virtuous force in the world which is the human imagination now i don't think we're, we're you know the the imagination is going to collapse or die or any stuff like that and i know a lot of people are scrambling to prove that it's still just as important as it was on the internet but it is definitely um you know it's it's not what it used to be the memory of machines is more powerful and i think in order for us to uh to be good McLuhanites and to understand what's already happened rather than trying to speculate about what's coming. The best thing that we can do is reactivate our human memories. Remember who we are, remember how we got here, and remember that we have faculties and capabilities that are very much good news that we need to rely on in order to fill up uh, the world uh, so that we have a real presence uh, so that we can share it with the virtual world. Very good. That was uh, like you could make a nice book out of that. You should uh, publish that. A short introduction to McLuhanism. Now let's go into the, I think, the first original coinage that I ran across in the book. Uh, very key concept in the book, maybe the key concept, the idea of the first generation. Tell us about that. Sure. So, you know, cards on the table. I am a father. I have a 12, 12 year old son. Um, he's going to be turning 13 in a very short period of time bracing myself for that. And so as I as I recount in the book, this is a this is a kid who, you know, who is a digital native. I, you know, of course, exercise some controls over what he consumes and what he doesn't. But it was important to me and increasingly so uh, as I was sorting through these issues to satisfy myself that he was, you know, going to have a, a complete and mature understanding of this media environment as he entered into adulthood, as he passed from, from boy to man, especially at a time when for so many people, I mean, you look at all these kind of sad social indicators, you know, 
uh, childbirth is going down and marriage is going down and lifelong partnerships are going down and testosterone is going down and the sperm counts going down. And it's all just like, Nyeh. and there are reasons for that. But amid that kind of uh, all these indicators that people really don't know what the hell is coming and they don't understand their place in the world anymore. And they feel like being human is maybe bad news. We are losing the kinds of rites of passage that, that used to be, and I think always must be, critical, uh, foundational for, uh, for new human beings being brought onto this earth. Uh, they need to understand, they need structure, they need purpose, they need an identity formation as they pass from boys and girls uh, to, to men and women. And so one of those is certainly today has to be a proper, intuitive, and really freely developed grasp on, uh, on exactly what this digital world is. Um, and an understanding of the fact that you can and should remain fruitfully human in that world. And so as I was writing this book, I really started thinking about, uh, about generations. Uh, the world of, uh, of, of electric media, the world of television and film in Hollywood was one in which I think we were encouraged to think of each generation as being sort of a, a revolutionary update on the previous you know, whether it's, it's Pepsi always trying to sell a product with the taste of a new generation or, um, you know, uh, just the way that MTV sort of presented and positioned itself. You know, you had uh, a Bill Clinton's uh, campaign in, in 1992 really trafficking on, you know, don't stop thinking about tomorrow, yesterday's gone, all that kind of language. It was very much focused around this idea that the thing that distinguished uh, different groups of people in, in our time was the generation. It wouldn't be ancient hatreds, wouldn't be nationalism, wouldn't even necessarily be our location on the planet. It would be generations. And what I've what I've discovered, and I think anecdotally, you know, there's there this is this is becoming an increasing topic of conversation, is that ever since, you know, let's just say ever since the iPhone, ever since the iPhone appeared, the generational analysis has started getting a little tricky. Uh, you start polling people and what you see is, yeah, you know, there are broad trends going this way or that. But increasingly, the age that you are is not a, a, a very good proxy for, you know, things like political beliefs, but I think more importantly, attitudes about technology and attitudes about, you know, the, the value of, of being human uh, in, in a digital world. And that would make sense insofar as it is a world of imagination that is receding away and it is a world of memory that is coming into play and that people are uh, reorienting themselves can see it in the way that, that people are trying to move closer to their families in the wake of COVID. You can see it in the way that uh, people who who were born, you know, even uh, a couple generations apart, as long as they consider themselves to be belong to this sort of digitally native world, they're much more similar than people who are born closer together who are on the other side of the divide. So here I am, you know, I got I got a kid who's about to become a teenager. He's going to be a member of the first cohort of human beings who really come of age and into adults with no memory themselves, no personal memory of life before the digital world. And so they're a very important generation. They're the first generation that's going to be like that. And what that means is their parents have a special responsibility and a special duty to do everything that they can uh, to ensure that that first generation to hit adulthood with no memory of life before digital technology really has their, their, their head and their heart and their soul screwed on straight. Uh, we're going to need them to be in good physical and mental shape. And if they're not, then, you know, we're, then we're really going to be uh, flying into, uh, into uncharted waters. Uh, so, you know, I didn't exactly write the book for him. Uh, I wrote it more kind of about him and, and his, his, uh, his cohort. And I think, you know, as just because of the, the, the serendipities of history, being someone in that generation who's the parents of that, that founding generation. I uh, wanted to model the kind of special responsibility that we have and, and how we can go about talking about it. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got a, a, a new granddaughter, a couple of years old. My daughter's go. already thinking about, what do I do when her best friend shows up with an iPhone, right? And, you know, our daughter is quite adamant that seven-year-olds should not have iPhones, right? And so begs all kinds of questions about how do you enculturate your, your children to deal with these miraculous technologies in a way that they don't take over their lives. Well, and in a way that doesn't make them feel before they even have a chance to become, you know, to become mature human beings. 
to feel like these are basically just alien gods that they there's not much for them to do in life other than just use them and be used by them you know that's definitely a a danger of unsupervised you know unsupervised use of these technologies is the kid you know will just very very early on understand uh, in the lack of any kind of proper human cultural upbringing that you know that the the the, the focus is not on them anymore they're they're really just a cog in this this larger thing yeah, I also wonder about some of the programming of you know human reality. You know, for I talked about this on the show several times. What's it like to be a twelve-year-old boy today and have the most unbelievable five X Ukrainian pornography on tap twenty-four hours a day? You know, I remember as about an eleven-year-old, me and my buddy walking five miles round trip to get uh, his uncle, who was in the Merchant Marines, collection of titty magazines. You know, these just you know women with their tits hanging out. We thought it was the greatest thing in the world. We walked five miles on a hot summer day to get them, and we buried them in the woods. And they're one of our valuable possessions. So that shows you how motivated young boys are. But you know, type in whatever vile thing you can imagine in your phone and have full motion video and audio of the most depraved sex imaginable. How do you deal with that? Or, you know, how do you even think about that as a reasonable thing for human beings to be exposed to at that age? Well, I think to a degree it is the toxicity level is becoming so blatant that I think from what I can gather, there is a, a sort of reactionary impulse growing on the side of younger Americans. You know, these, these tweens are not looking at millennials and saying like, oh, I wish I could be just like them. You know, they see the damage. They see the damage that has been wrought in these younger generations uh, and some of which are not so young anymore. Millennials are hitting 40 and, uh, you know, I, I'm not here to sort of ridicule or, or just bag on anyone for the sake of, uh, you know, scoring scoring points but there's just no question that the, the 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 mental health situation in the under 40 crowd is extremely bad the physical health situation is is very bad many millions addicted to ssris they're never going to come off them many millions of people who consider themselves basically too broken to to engage in core human activities loneliness friendlessness hating your family, being, being isolated and alienated. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, the, the Japanese have written a lot about this. So they're going through an even more bizarre and painful version of it. Michelle Ulebeck has written about this in, in, you know, about as dramatic form as, as he can. He seems at this point, like he's saying, you know, like, what else do I have to tell you people in order to convince you that this is a serious problem? And so for younger kids who, you know, who have not been utterly corrupted by the internet, you know, one of the things that they see online and off, uh, especially over the past two years, is really just a, a complete break from even the world that they knew in, in uh, you know, in 2016, 2017. Uh, they see a lot of their peers um, basically just getting online and presenting themselves in increasingly bizarre ways and having what appear to be complete mental breakdowns um, on the daily. This is a, a constant stream of content. And if you're, you know, just kind of a, a fairly normy American kid, you look at this stuff and you go like, why is this happening now? This wasn't really happening, you know, five years ago. And it's been interesting to see, you know, for, for a 12 year old kid to have nostalgia about life, you know, three years ago, really palpable. And for, you know, to get questions like, dad, why is everyone so weird now? Dad, why, why does it seem like people are dumber now than they were two years ago? Like what's going on? You know, and then and then I, I I've I've been able to show him things over the the past however many years that that stopped him cold too. You know, the, the New York Times ran an op-ed a number of years ago from you know I'm, well, who I'm sure is a very loving and well-meaning soccer mom who wrote this op-ed about how her her two boys were sitting in the back of the the SUV coming home from soccer practice. And they're like laughing and giggling and and making fun of some stuff that they see on their smartphones or whatever. And she's like, what are you watching? And they're like, oh, YouTube mom. And she's like, oh, no, because she feels like her kids are are being uh, radicalized toward, you know, extreme right wing ideologies because they're sort of telling jokes and laughing about being triggered on YouTube. And this was years ago. And I show this to my son and I'm like, I just want you to know that, like, this is. This is what's being published at the New York Times today, you know, and, and he reads it. And it's basically about kids like him. And he's just couldn't 
you know, you couldn't understand how it could be that, you know, that the, the paper of record, something that even a nine year old knows about, would be basically publishing, you know, these, uh, these fear mongering articles about how kids like him are going to be turning into Nazis because they're telling each other jokes on YouTube and in Call of Duty chats and in the Discord. So, yeah, you know, there is this, obviously, there's this huge danger that kids are going to get sort of sucked into the internet and turned into depraved monstrosities. But I really, you know, what I'm seeing is there's already a push back, uh, a push where it's like, you know, they, they, they know how they know their way around TikTok. They'd rather be watching sort of absurd shitpost videos on TikTok than crying girls with blue hair screaming that they don't, re- you know, there's a cultural gap that's dividing within the generations. I think that the the technological impact um, of that cultural gap is one that's going to give parents greater challenges. Yes, but in some ways, it's going to I think bring parents and, and their kids closer together culturally. Again. I'm going to bet the opposite. I'm going to bet that's going to actually make our society more bimodal than it is so already. There'll be some parents who are capable of dealing with this, but the vast preponderance will just punt because they haven't a clue how to deal with it. But we shall see. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot. I think a lot of people have have already punted, and we're dealing with the consequences of that. It'll be interesting, you know, as as kids, young kids, see what happens if you spend too much time on the internet, and see it around them. I think it will make make give parents something a little bit more to hold on to, uh, and they'll they'll feel a little bit. You know, I think a lot of parents felt like there was something wrong with them if they tried to stop their kids from using these things that have swept over the world. And I, you know, I understand that, but there is a middle path and there is a way to ensure that your kids get good at using this technology and are not afraid of this technology and don't take a passive attitude toward it or a too late attitude toward it without, you know, getting them in over their head and getting them into dark waters. Yeah, it's a great balance. Hope you can carry it out. Uh, let's move on to another one of your interesting ideas. You describe the two ruling factions today in our society as the expert engineers and the ethereal ethicists. You know, you don't mention investment bankers and politicians or Hollywood celebrities or, you know, any of the usual people we think of as ruling factions. You, you, you name the ethereals. And the engineers, who the hell are they and why are they the ruling faction? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you want to understand this stuff, think about why is it Barack Obama finished his two terms. He could do anything that he wanted to do. And what he did was he inked a deal with Netflix. Why did he do that? The engineers are who they sound like. They're the folks who think that the best thing that we can do is, uh, is keep building new things. And the best way to keep building new things is to successfully conduct what Umberto Eco refers to as the, the search or the quest for the perfect language. These guys who think that our destiny, uh, much like Faust, is, uh, is to find the courage to exceed our bounds and that the way to do this will be through the perfect language of mathematics. They have this vision of, of perfect determinacy. They, they didn't like it when Norbert Wiener said, hey, Actually, um, you know, speaking of Faust, all this stuff that you're building is actually more more similar to the Sorcerer's Apprentice situation than to uh, you know just creating these these robot slaves that will carry out your wishes. Wiener warned very pointedly that determinacy in uh, programming was going to let people down, give them a false sense of security. He was worried about it specifically with regard to nuclear weapons. But, you know, he also he used the, the analogy of the monkey's paw where, you know, careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Machines are not human and they're not going to understand human instructions and do carry out human orders in the way that we would want human beings to. And that goes all the more when you're not just talking about programming one device or one machine or even one network of machines. But when you're talking about, as you know, Schmidt and some of these other guys are clearly envisioning programming all of the devices programming the entire swarm uh, so as to, uh, you know, to finally get the world into a sort of perfect working order. That's, you know, that's not every engineer walking uh, on the face of this earth. But if you just look at the trajectory of the development of these technologies, uh, especially since World War II, you see uh, the fruit of, uh, of a, a deep civilization level wager that probably began with, uh, with guys like Pythagoras that, you know, that we could use uh, tools to leverage uh, our will and to leverage our will uh, so that we could ultimately, you know, to lift, lift the earth off its, uh, 
off its axis or out of its orbit, a sort of will with no limit. And the way in which uh, engineering has moved away from the natural science of philosophy and ever more in, toward the, the science of creating ever more powerful weapons, uh, ever more powerful forms of control. That's a big part of the book. And the reason why the ethereals are in there, the ethicists, is because... Um, I want you to define the ethereal. That's, a, I think, a, that was a word I'd never heard used that way. Probably my audience is the same way. Well, I mean, you know, this, there, there are a couple of fun reasons for that. I mean, you think about it, it wasn't that long ago when the ether was something that the scientists seriously theorized about and thought that was a, it was an actual substance out there in the ether, so to speak. I mean, really, it was, I, I think it was Mickelson and Morley who uh, conducted the experiments that proved that ether did not exist. And, and uh, Einstein gave them uh, a lot of credit for making, you know, all of the, the kind of theoretical physics that resulted such an important part of, of scientific development. So, you know, so, so what's, what's out there in the ether is this is the world of the imagination. Uh, this is the world of ethics. This is the world of, of dreaming as a kind of moral code. The, uh, the, the methods of dreaming best, dreaming the biggest and best dreams. And uh, the way that, that uh, the technology developed in the U.S. was conducive to uh, and, and reinforcing of the hope that, that many people had that the way f- that we would remain in control of technology was by having the best ethics, sort of having the best dreams that, uh, you know, a guy like Walt Disney could say, you know, I'm going to build this, uh, this, this community of the future. I mean, Epcot Center is what's left of that, you know, whether it was Disney or Ellen Hubbard. I mean, there are lots of these guys, Jack Parsons, people who, you know, were, were really very optimistic about technology, but were optimistic about it because they thought, you know, well, technology might never be perfect. Math might never be perfect. But gosh darn it, we can have these pure dreams, we can purify our ethics, and, and through that kind of a spiritual purity, we can purify the machines. And I think that that kind of dialectic between people who thought that we could use ethics to purify technology and people who thought we could use technology to purify ethics, that's resulted in this kind of tug of war and this kind of merging together of these, these two sides into a single kind of regime. A regime that thinks that, you know, we've gotten to a point where basically Americans and others just need to shut up and turn the keys over to the people with most expert ethics and the most expert engineering. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that struggle playing out right now. I mean, I think it's, you know, anyone at this point can recognize that the uh, the balance of power in, in tech is right now tilting toward people who are willing to accept any amount of wokeness as long as they still get to build the technology. And then the balance of power in politics, you know, the, there's a lot of momentum now with, with the Wokies who would be willing to accept any amount of technological development so long as they were able to con- exercise a religious veto over uh, the, the use and deployment of these technologies. So in some ways, you know, these two sides are kind of working as a unit or, or presenting them, uh, a future to people where, you know, we'll, have, we'll perfect technology and we'll perfect ethics and you won't need you. You won't need to own anything. You won't need to be a citizen anymore. You can just kind of live in this this you know virtual world that we've created for you. But the reality is, you know, there there are real tensions either, even there. And I think uh, uh, part of the, the chaos and the scrambling that you see, you know, in, in Twitter and uh, you know Netflix subscriptions going down and uh, people sort of questioning what Jeff Bezos' next move. All of this is of a piece. And I think a lot of Americans feel like they're being totally left out and sidelined by these struggles. And so uh, hopefully that's an invitation for people to get, you know, to get more involved and, and consider themselves to be good enough right now uh, to participate seriously in public life again. Yeah, actually, I think there is some good news here. Another part of my life, I'm one of the co-founders and president of the MIT Free Speech Alliance, which spun up in response to one of the more horrific cancel culture events. And I've been watching this now carefully for a while. And I've made the prediction that 2021 was actually peak woke and that the curve is now on the other side and it's going to gather momentum very rapidly because a lot of people who mouth the woke words don't actually believe them. But they've been intimidated by a small number of ultra vicious trolls into going along. So once people start getting the sense that peak woke has been reached, the downside of that curve is going to be way faster than we would have thought, which is really good news. 
Well, I, I, it, it could very well be. I mean, I always, you know, try to keep them at the back of my head and, and tell people who, uh, you know, are, are occasionally very black pilled, as the kids say, is, uh, you know, you have to remember that this might be as bad as it gets for a while. Yeah, well, I think it is. And, and it's out improving already. So, you know, I, I mean, I think the Wokies are, are learning the hard way that you really just can't establish a religion in America. That's in some ways, you know, the First Amendment is vulnerable to, let's say, you know, people in government who you can't really vote out all agreeing on, uh, on one, one ideology that becomes more and more of a spiritual ethical commitment and deciding that they're going to use their power to just try to establish it. Uh, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of that over the past several years. And I think the, the blowback and the backlash is inevitable and growing. And building out my, uh, another one, my, you know, Jordan Hall, we talked about earlier, he likes to say, reality is the checksum on our ideas, right? <laughs> uh, and eventually when shit is just ridiculous, I mean, like this gender crapola, right? I mean, eventually common sense revolts and uh, says, uh, no, uh, women are the ones that have children, people with two X chromosomes and this pussyfooting around with all this bizarre stuff. It's just not right. Now, moving on to another topic, there's a fair amount of God talk in this book. You mentioned various religions, various imaginings of God. You know, you talk about different religious traditions, both within the Abrahamic faith and elsewhere. And you even describe one of my favorite characters, good old Freeman Dyson. Oh, yeah who people have described as an agnostic Christian polytheist, right? If there could ever be such a thing, but I think Freeman sincerely was. When you when you use the God talk, the God word, to you, is that a metaphor? You know, is it a hole in the human psyche that has to be filled with something, some culturally appropriate material? Or are you a person who takes the God word and the God idea as something that points to something that's actual. I'd love to get your thoughts on what you mean when you talk the God talk. Yeah, sure. Uh, a, a couple layers. I think that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville was right when he said religion is the only permanent state of mankind. And what that means is it, in, it is inherent to us and inescapably so that we are worshipers. We are prone and apt to worship something, someone, uh, to to hold uh, something or someone up as the highest, as our, our point of contact with the ultimate, uh, with the all, with the source. You know, you can go to someone like uh, John Calvin to see a pessimistic account of human beings as really idle factories. This goes a step beyond saying that we are we are the worshipful creature to saying that we are you know still worse. We we produce things that we know are not gods and we treat them as if that we are, as if they were gods and we get out of uh, feeling bad about that by saying like oh don't worry you know we're we're not worshiping the wrong gods we're just pretending to worship these things that we've created and I think you know psychologically that's definitely something. That goes on too. Uh, so you know, human beings are worshipful, and on top of that, we are we are apt to play play tricks on ourselves, where we treat things that we know are not gods worshipfully uh, or with undue devotion, and then we rationalize to ourselves by saying like, "Oh well, you know, we we know that we're not really worshipful when we're actually worshiping these things. We know that they're just idols that we fashioned, uh, and yet we go on in that in that way anyway." So the, the, sociologically speaking, that's, that's my standpoint. Uh, I myself am, am a Christian, probably so. And so, you know, I, I feel that it is important for people in general to hear kind of a, a, a current uh, Christian assessment of the technological situation. I think a lot of Christians out there right now are just as spun out and turned around as everyone else. Uh, and if anything, feel tempted to do uh, uh, another thing that we humans are very apt to do, which is call down the apocalypse, which is to judge ourselves harshly and to say, you know, my life is bad right now, so the world is ending. You know, we have a, a temptation to, to see the end of the world wherever we turn, in good times as well as bad. And for me as a Christian, you know, it's very important that the counsel of Christ himself is, no, actually, only God the Father knows when the end times will be, that it is not for us to, uh, to presume to, to create the day of judgment, to separate 
the wheat and the tares. Uh, Jesus says, no, you have to let those things grow together and wait for the harvest, even if it is very painful and awkward and leaves you feeling doubt um, and leaves you feeling like things just keep getting worse and worse. Yeah, there are many actions that you can take, but you should not mistake a bad time for the end time. And so just as I think that, uh, that, that the broader audiences should receive uh, a current Christian assessment of our technological situation, I also think that, you know, that Christians need to receive a technological assessment that helps them remember that just because they feel out of control and feel like they're being dwarfed by these technologies does not at all mean uh, that the end times are here uh, and that they need to, uh, you know, start acting the way Christians did during the Black Plague. Yes, you know, penitence is always good. Now is always a good time for penitence and repentance. But uh, we need to make sure that we don't take those things to an anti-human degree. Yeah, it's interesting. As a uh, high enlightenment non-believer, I think I nonetheless agree with you from a complexity perspective that when complex systems are unfolding, we can't predict with any certainty at all what will happen. We can you know, make some guesses and we can probe and we can nudge. So we can come from two different perspectives and uh, come up with a similar view that maybe shit's going to fall apart, but maybe it's not, right? Well, that's right. And and I think, you know, there, there are too many smart people who have become too convinced that unless they are given all of the power and control to poke the blob, to poke the swarm and try to understand the swarm and to build machines that can understand the swarm faster than the humans can understand it, unless they are given full control to push toward that kind of singularity, the whole world is going to fall apart. I just think that that's not so. And I think, you know, if you if you convince yourself that you're the guy, you know, you're the Messiah, you're the one who needs to organize the world's information or else it's all going to collapse, you're going to start making the kinds of, of fatal mistakes that human beings have characteristically made through all of human history. Yeah, the Greeks had a word for it, hubris, right? That's right. One of my favorite terms in our little Game B movement, we like to talk about epistemic humility. Our ability to know is less than we sometimes think. And I think both of our lenses come up with a similar perspective on that. Well, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, we could use some ontological humility, too. Uh, I actually uh, add a third one, which is a metaphysical parsimony. Yes. Uh, but people really resist that. Humans want to elaborate these unbelievably complex metaphysical systems. And I, I always warn you, is it necessary? Develop no more metaphysics than you need for your epistemology. Yeah, well, when, in a world of surplus elites, people feel like they need to overcomplicate things and overexplain things. Otherwise, they might have to sit in silence for a minute and, and start thinking, start remembering who they really are. Yeah, the, you know, overproduction of elites, my friend Peter Turchin. That's a, a key idea. We're burning our time faster than I would like. So let me hop ahead to some other things. You introduced an idea I'd never heard of, Hebraic British Protestant theology. You <laughs> used the term Eight times, at least Hebraic, British, Protestant. Never heard that. Uh, I don't I much believe I've ever encountered those three words together. What is it and why is it important? Yeah. So you go back to, to the Reformation. You got uh, religious war in England. You got Presbyterians in Scotland. You got Catholics in England. You got Protestants in England who are anti-Catholic. Some of those leave. Puritans bail out. They're like, we, we give up, we're out. But ultimately, the upper hand goes to the Anglicans. And so, you know, once again, with all due respect to uh, any Anglicans who may be uh, listening into the show, you know, what's that? What's an Anglican? Well, it's just like Catholicism, except the, uh, the king is also the pope, right? So spiritual and temporal authority unified in a single person, just like Thomas Hobbes says we need to do the leviathan right? the leviathan but hobbes was you know hobbes was not just this this rank scientific materialist that he's often made out to be there's a whole you know the third book of uh, i think it's book three third book of the leviathan is all about the christian commonwealth and he was actually quite serious about thinking through the political theological implications of the, the advancement of science and technology uh, and communications media in his, in his time, as, as he well should have been. And so where does Hobbes look theologically to give shape and justification to the structure of the Leviathan, of the one overarching, overawing 
unitary uh, sovereign who combines spiritual and temporal authority into that of a quote unquote mortal God. Well, he looks to the Old Testament. He does not look to the New Testament. He looks to Moses. And basically he says, yes, Moses was right. You come down from the mountaintop with the tablets and you realize that you're gone for one second and suddenly the many are sacrificing children to Baal again. And you go, you know, I Karumba, you know, there's no intermediary between me and the many. I am getting it direct from God and I'm presenting it to the many and I have to be the sovereign. Otherwise, everything falls apart. And interesting, interesting claim. There seemed to be evidence for that during the English Civil War, seemed to be evidence for that throughout the rest of Europe during the wars after the rise of print. But a potent political theological claim and one that was quite Hebraic. This was not tapping the New Testament for an understanding of how to create a good Christian commonwealth in the modern age. You look at another guy, uh, John Locke. Locke considered to be very different from Hobbes. uh, And of course, in many ways he was. Here's one place where they're similar. John Locke was also trying to understand how to generate the correct political theology in, in the early modern age. And so where did he look in the Bible? Not the New Testament. He went back to the Old Testament. He went back to Adam instead of Moses. And he said, okay, basically we're all Adam. We all inherit the the warrant that God granted to Adam to basically go forth into nature and, and to flourish, to use the world that has been given to us, to mix it with our labor. And this is kind of the basis of social organization from which we can begin to understand justice. So once again, you have a, a, uh, a seminal British Protestant political theorist taking a, a firmly Hebraic approach to a biblical understanding of how to, uh, how to architect justice in the print age. And so you start getting some color in Anglicanism, uh, which over time becomes sort of less and less Catholic and more and more Protestant. But as you move forward into you know, the 19th and the 20th century, you start asking yourself, you know, what, what does this religion actually entail? I mean, when, when Prince Charles says that he wants to be the defender of the faithful, not the defender of the faith, you know, exactly what is going on here. Um, and I think what you see is the influence over centuries of not just the Old Testament as such, but the influence of uh, Jewish theological frameworks in, in understanding uh, man's place in the cosmos begin to sort of fill in uh, to animate Anglican political theology and increasingly to animate uh, the way that the British Empire saw itself. I mean, you can look for it in obvious places like with Benjamin Disraeli and Disraeli's circle, uh, which, you know, overlapped uh, as as it did for so many of those guys in the Victorian age with the circles of Charles Darwin and the circles of uh, Bulwer-Lytton, uh, the, who, the, the famous author of It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Yes. The Buller Lytton computation, right? Yes. <laughs> People don't know that Lytton, you know, was was tied in with Parliament. He served in Parliament for a while. He liked to write science fiction. He wrote a book called Vril about the coming race of uh, you know folks who lived underground and had mastered this uh, this primal energy that was basically electricity and had achieved uh, you know sort of utopia uh, this time under under the Earth's surface instead of on it. And so the currents of thought coming out of the early modern era and going all the way through to, you know, to basically Turing, to the the Babbage and Turing and the invention of of computation in England, was really a much more Hebraic than the New Testament understanding of man's place in the cosmos and of how, you know, if God is is uh, is occluded or if God is is no longer directly accessible to us then, well, what we can do is we can get really good at at reading God's book, which God has left to us, which is the natural world. And we can become closer to God by becoming more God-like in our understanding of the material world and how we can use it to, to, uh, to pursue our dreams, our visions, our grand objectives. That is, you know, that is a, a, a political theology that I think looks mighty strange to a lot of American Christians who are much more apt to say, ah, you know, the Old Testament, yeah, that's the Bible, but it's really the New Testament that counts. And so tracing the way that, you know, we were, we're apt to think of the, the Anglosphere as kind of one unit or to think of the West as one unit, when really I think what we've seen uh, over the course of uh, you know, the past several centuries is many nominally Christian 
nations, including ones with established churches like, like England, actually move in a more Hebraic direction theologically. And Dan Glarnter, another one of these guys who's thought a lot about these, these topics. I'm sorry, Dan is his, uh, is his son, David Glarnter. His book, Americanism, a very slim volume, but incredibly evocative in the way that he says, like, look, you know, Christianity basically ran its course in America with the Puritans. These, uh, these Unitarians come along and they kind of, you know, just it's really loosey goosey. And the, the moral and religious uh, and political fiber of America for him does not really return until Lincoln comes along and becomes kind of the Old Testament president of the United States. You know, the, Lincoln says very sparing remarks on Jesus very abstract language about the divine and the big touchstones for him came out of the old testament this is a big deal for galanter he, he's a guy who says like the the upshot of jewish theology with regard to technology is that the best we can do to get closer to god is to just get better at uh, at understanding the secrets of the universe and and exercising some control over them as we advance technologically so uh that's the long and short of hebraic british protestantism Something that that you know has gotten a lot, uh, some people have gotten a lot of juice out of, uh, but ultimately I think is uh, is not quite as as uh, congruent with American civilization as uh, as someone like Galanter has argued that it is. All right. Well, we're uh, rolling through here. Not not covers as much ground as I'd like in my topic, so I'm gonna have to skip over some of this stuff. Uh, would have had a nice little chat about Pynchon, formerly one of my very favorite authors. Oh man, uh, Gerlinter. We talked on, fortunately, and I even wanted to hit on the start of the Gospel of John, but I think we're gonna have to jump all over that and move on to another, I think, very strong statement you made, and it has me scratch my head just a little bit, and that is you had quite a good section late in the book on what you called queering and queerness, and very interesting, and I would say strong statement, and I'm going to read here, because electric age ruling factions and mass people disenchanted by the digital catastrophe are now desperate for just such an ultimate, all-meaningful, and all-transcending principle, queerness is now the supreme candidate to fulfill that need. Therefore, it is everywhere seemingly capable of springing forth from any apparatus of thought or cultural tradition. Now, I got to say, you hear about this stuff, and I live in a very rural part of Virginia, deep in Appalachia. And this kind of stuff isn't too current where we are, right, to say the least. But so maybe you can start at the beginning and, and what is queerness and queering and, and how do you see it fitting into our current state of, of things? Sure. Well, you know, we talked a little bit about busy work for overproduced elites, and there's no question that that has had some of the effect in the way that queer theory has gone from a cubbyhole tucked away in uh, the bowels of every university to something that is just at the very forefront of the public debate and in everyone's mind. I mean, you can't go, you know, five minutes on the internet without being uh, asked to engage in some way or another with some flavor or another of queerness. And so the question is, you know, why is this happening? And what about technology's effects on us can we understand uh, to, to sort of piece this together? Another point of insight here is, you know, why is it that transgender or transsexual identity rocketed up to the very, very top of the of the prestige stack of the, you know, the 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 queer memeing so much so that, you know, they got these kind of triangle stripes invading the, the rainbow flag very aggressively and very suddenly and leaving, you know, more than a few gay Americans to sort of scratching their heads as, as you suggested, you know, like, why is this happening so fast? Where is it going? And I think that you can see some answers to those questions in some of the, 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 the technological literature. Uh, you go back to something like, like the Cyborg Manifesto, which was written in the 1980s. Uh, and you can see it in Shulamith Firestone and some other, you know, feminist writers who said like, yes, we need to embrace technology because at last it will allow women to break the grip of our given natural bodies on our identities. And so you can see, you know, even from the, the 70s and 80s, this current of thought start to, to kick in where, where technology had this salvific power uh, because it gave human beings uh, a kind of godlike control over 
the body and over eroticism, over, you know, what someone like Wilhelm Reich would have described as orgone energy, you know, this kind of mystical sexual force. And in that respect, you know, it became kind of the foundation for, for a new theological understanding of what it meant to be a human being and maybe, you know, what, what opportunities existed for, for liberating oneself or using technology to liberate oneself from one's humanity. What is sex in a world where our, our given incarnate bodies are not sacred, where they're just kind of a substrate, one that might, you know, in some ways hold us back from, from justice, from becoming who it is that we really are, as some like to say. And so, you know, for me, like, this is, this is very powerful in understanding why it is that what is now referred to with the, the floating prefix of trans has become so powerful in American life and so disproportionate in the way that it is being really forced on uh, on Americans and Americans who are basically being told that, you know, it's not enough to tolerate, it's not enough to accept, it's not even enough to celebrate. You need to hold these people out. We need to recognize them as founders of a new order as heroes in, in a vanguard, which, you know, we need to follow these people toward our destiny, our destiny, our transhuman destiny as, as beings who have fundamentally reorganized our relationship to sex and pleasure and identity through the power that technology grants us. You know, what's, what's going on with trans is not magically and retroactively becoming a member of the opposite sex. It's becoming a cyborg in a new and powerful way that until just a few years ago was, was really not possible. So, you know, if you go back to the 17th century and you encounter someone walking down the street saying, you know, I woke up this morning and I've come to realize that I'm actually a member of the opposite sex. This person would seem eccentric and not particularly significant to, you know, the, the main trends of social and economic life at that time. But because of where we are techno technologically, uh, suddenly, those kinds of claims, those kinds of desires, those kinds of projects become much more central to the, the spiritual war that is being fought out over the terms of what kind of political life we're going to have in a digital age. It's an interesting point that prior to this very recent epoch, just, you know, five, seven or eight years ago, classic gender body dysphoria was very rare, about one in 10,000 people. It was typically diagnosed the age two to five. Uh, it seemed to be damn close to immutable. And it was dominantly male to female oriented. And then suddenly, very suddenly, in fact, I now call it mimetic trans emerged on the scene maybe eight to 10 years ago. And it has very different statistical attributes. You know, it tends to be discovered age 12 or above, it is less immutable and it is overwhelmingly female to male rather than where the traditional dysphoria syndromes came in. And I must say, it's probably considered politically correct, but this pattern reminds me of mimetically propagated psychological problems like suicide and cutting and anorexia, et cetera, much more than it reminds me of innate characteristics like gayness, right? Just in a simple sense, think that the early onset body gender dysphoria of the classical form, one in 10,000, very similar to gayness. It seems to be sort of innate. This new kind of thing that we're seeing blooming everywhere is sort of mimetic and psychocontagious in its attributes. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, I don't think there's any question, but that that's more or less what's going on. And so in the before times, the whole question of how a person in that sort of predicament ought to be regarded was very different from what it is that we have now. You know, this is we have long ago left the territory of, you know, why can't people just do what they want? And we are in a territory where I, I, I mean, you know, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called Our Post-Human Future, and everyone's always talking about the end of history, but not even Frank wants to talk about our post-human future anymore. And it's a damn shame because he put his finger on some important things. And if you understand those important things, you will recognize 
you know, why is it that liberalism is struggling so hard right now? And the answer is because technological conditions changed in a way that is inspiring large numbers of liberals to abandon liberalism and to attempt to create and embrace and establish a new post-human religion. That's just what's going on. And I know that this is like kind of uncharted waters for Americans to deal with. But I also think that, you know, this this backlash that we're talking about, this is not coming from personal animosity. This is not coming from a desire to oppress people with alternative lifestyles. This is coming from a resistance to the establishment of a post-human religion in America. And that backlash is is deeply natural and deeply practical. And so, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, regardless of, of where you want to situate yourself on the spectrum of sexual identity, you got to confront the reality of the situation. And there's got to be a, a workable uh, modus vivendi for us to land on because the, the current trajectory just is at odds with our, our way of life, with our, our form of government, and ultimately with our humanity. Interesting. Yeah, let's move on now to what comes next on this road. If we talk about transhumanism, I've actually appeared on the transhumanist stage one time and argued with them, basically. And it was kind of fun. But you think about the radical transhumanists who are looking forward to merging with the machine, right? Uh, they want uh, Elon Musk's neural link in their head on the first available date. Uh, and that's one track. And then the other track, that's often the same people, are also working towards artificial general intelligence, where the machine finally does become as intelligent or perhaps much more so than we are. How do those two next steps, which haven't yet truly fully occurred, but seem to be within the foreseeable future, how does that impact your vision of what's happening with our society and this this idea of yours that it might be better to remain human forever? Yeah, well, I mean, some of, the, some of what's going on here is just figuring out how to use the the right words to mean the right things. I think that human enhancement by in, in technological form is just going to continue. Some of it's going to be disfiguring and that's going to be unfortunate. But I do think, you know, science is, is going to get better at giving people the ability to extend their lifespans. My best understanding of things is that you're really not going to be able to take advantage of those opportunities unless you are already in close to peak physical condition the the natural way. I think that's a point that oftentimes gets overlooked in the the fever dreams of some of the more wide-eyed transhumanists. You know, if you're not in great shape, you're probably not going to be able to take advantage of the technologies that get you to that next level. And I think that there's some poetic justice in that. But look, you know, even Christians, I mean, you talk about the Old Testament, you got people walking around who are 400, 500, 600, 700 years old. And, you know, I, it's funny to me that a lot of uh, rationalists will say, oh, well, those are just myths, but we should do it for real. And it's like, well, you know, OK, but anyway, you slice it. It's not really post-human to try to push out the human lifespan, even 100 additional years. So the argument there for me is like, practically speaking, we might want to get a little bit better at living as human beings who die around 110 years old before we start unlocking these, you know, these higher levels we won't be ready. You can you can be really soft on technological progress or, or even welcoming of it while still having a pretty hard nosed, pragmatic uh, and practical attitude toward, you know, look, you got to do this at a rate that allows people to wrap their minds around it, to master it, to, to understand the pitfalls. And if you, you know, permissionless innovation can be great, soulless innovation, not so much. And if you start throwing innovations at people who are, are alienated from their soul and do not have a firm anthropological understanding of who we are and how we got here, then you're just going to get bad results. I don't think there's any debating that. And so, you know, I know that there's some transhumanists out there. I mean, Balaji Srinivasan, I'm friends with him. We've, we've gone around the bush on this a couple of times, you know, and he's like, well, you know, don't get me wrong, James. I don't want to use technology to make people into like, like dysfunctional cat people. Like I want to use it to make us bigger and better and stronger and live longer. And to me, you know, that's that's something more like like human maxing than it is like really a spiritual project to to liberate ourselves from our given human form and to substitute in for God, either our our ascended selves or the technology that takes us there. 
And ultimately, you know, you got people who are insistent. We're going to upload our consciousness to the cloud, James. Okay, well, what's consciousness? Oh, well, uh, um, well, you know, the word consciousness as we use it has only been around since maybe the mid 1600s. I mean, these are very, very fresh baby concepts, and there's not a lot of meat on those bones. And for people who are so insistent that you know, no, the soul is just a just a, a figment of the imagination, and you know, we must ignore all these religious texts. But I'm going to believe in something called consciousness, and I'm going to believe we can suck it out of people and spit it into a machine. I find that to be far fetched. And ultimately, you know, I, I think that an AGI that is uh, a, achieves some godlike level of intelligence is also far fetched. You need a lot of energy to power that kind of thing, even just to power the kind of machine that will maybe one day produce an AGI on that level. That's the kind of energy that, by some estimates, would require the entire output of, of planet Earth. I know that we might get a little more efficient at generating energy, but even so, like, why? Why put the energy into that? Why do we want to build such a thing like that? That's really the level that the conversation needs to, to unfold at. And I think, you know, we just got a lot of bored people who are alienated from their souls, can't really accept or understand that we've been given the resources that we need to live well already. And so they start applying their, their great intelligence and their, their great resources to these kind of insane projects, to these uh, projects that are ultimately going to undermine and defeat our purpose here on this planet. That doesn't mean Luddism is good. That doesn't mean that anytime someone innovates something, we should be afraid. But it does mean that that those of us who are the most accepting and welcoming of our human being need to assert themselves and take some responsibility for this world that we live in, because it's too important to to leave it to you know to to the the wild eyed dreamers on the one hand, or people who think that they can become gods through math on the other. I love it. Well, let's wrap it up right there. This has been an, a very interesting conversation. There's a lot in this book. and We skipped over a tremendous amount from my uh, show notes. So if you're interested in learning more, go to, what's the name of the website again? At least, at least speak it out. Canonic.xyz for the book. If you want to be on the Human Forever mailing list, that's humanforever.us. And as always, those links will be on our episode page. I'd like to thank you, James Polis, for coming on and talking about your book, Human Forever. Thanks a lot, Jim. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.